I'm very excited to be joined by Chris Russell from Tonic Energy. And Chris is going to briefly go through what Tonic Energy are about, what they're trying to do, the, the, all the, the complexities and the intrigue behind the new energy future. So I'm going to hand over to Chris. He's going to do a, 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 present, a short presentation, but then we, we're going to open up to the floor for questions and answers. I know I've got a lot of questions, but I'm, is that okay, Chris, if you just jump in there and, and tell us what you're doing? Sure. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, great to be here. So as Robert just said, my name is Chris Russell. I'm Managing Director and Co-Founder of Tonic Energy. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you about something that we've been working on for a long time and very passionate about. We call it the virtual power plant. And effectively, that's how you can get the most out of your home and your vehicle when we combine them together in more of a community type proposition. So if we, if we kind of start with where have we come from, if the uh, very large slides move on, um, we've come from a market that's typically been characterized by a lot of top-down generation. So big, traditional, dirty power station um, is, is sending us electricity. It's not very convenient. It's not very uh, renewable, that's for sure. And it's a bit outdated. So it's, it's, it's volatile in terms of price spikes. Um, it, we're not in control of where that is coming from, and it's certainly not sustainable. If you look at the, well, just this event, the number of electric vehicles we've got, the amount of solar that's out there, that kind of traditional top-down model just isn't fit for purpose. If we kind of look at where we're headed, if these work, um, we're, we're headed much more to a sort of distributed world. So looking around the room uh, today, there's loads of these propositions out there, which is really exciting to see. So we can own our own solar, we can get access to an electric vehicle, we can drive hundreds of miles, which even five years ago was just not possible. The opportunity for us is to effectively get away from the grid, get away from that top-down generation model and take control of what we're doing. There's also an opportunity, people talk a lot about prosumers, which is a really interesting one. So how can you generate more electricity than you're actually using and sell that back to the grid for benefit of both the community but, but yourself? And I think just as a, as a kind of a, a test case, it'd be really interesting to see in the room who's got solar, battery, or EV. I know I'm preaching to the converted, but if you put your hand up, if you've got solar, battery, or EV at the moment? Okay, so I think there'll be lots of interesting questions yeah. off the back of this, but clearly we are in, the, in a place now where this is, I, ho I hope that we all see this a bit of a tipping point. We're moving away from this traditional model, and actually we're all starting to ask what's the best way of doing this? How do we maximize value and also make it more sustainable? There's a few different challenges that we can, can talk about when we get into this sort of model. So anytime you Google EV or um, solar or renewable, there's always the naysayers. I'm sure most of us like to get on Twitter and have a bit of a bash about that every now and then. I know, Robert, you like to engage with a few of those. Um, of course, there's risks. If we all, for example, drive to Silverstone on one weekend and we all plug in our EVs and we all try and charge at the same time, surprise, surprise, there are a, a few logistical problems. But that's really an exception. Hopefully next year this won't be an exception, but it's not something that's happening day in, day out. We're really talking about peaks. If we look at what's happened in California with a massive uptake of, of solar, that caused quite a lot of transmission distribution problems, there are lots of outages, because actually there's just too much capacity coming back up through the grid rather than actually being used where it is. So there's a speed of uptake thing, but actually what we're really talking about is a peak causing a problem. If we look at the opportunities instead, so um, again, people that have got solar battery EV, you're probably saving somewhere in the order of magnitude of 400 to 600 pounds a year just by having that, that generation on your roof. If you got in early on the feed-in tariff, you're probably laughing, thinking it's a lot more than that, but that's not available to the rest of us for now. I think a, a really important part of this next phase is, well, where do we go from? So once you've optimized within your own property, you've done what you can to use your own solar, you've turned off your appliances, you've switched your EV tariff, it all starts to get a little bit diminishing returns. And I think that's where that little box at the bottom, the tonic in, in our instance, comes in. So is there something more we can do on an aggregated basis rather than just as a bunch of individuals doing the right thing? So this is where our, the better together comes in, the, the, the virtual power plant type concept. Now a friend of mine has animated these, so apologies if it all blows up. But uh, if we look at us on an individual basis, Sure, we've all got very different properties. It doesn't look like this at all. We're all using energy at different times. We're charging at different times. We're, we're at home at different times. We've got different sized houses. We live in different parts of the UK. So once we've done that optimization, as I say, we can't do much else. Someone else in the UK at a different time is probably looking to charge or looking to discharge. So when we start to bring things together, we start to smooth the peaks and troughs across that consumption curve. 
In addition, when we aggregate this, we can start to unlock some new things called grid services. So if anyone's spoken to National Grid or read their future of energy reports, we talk a lot about how does the grid modernize and keep pace with the changes that are being driven by things like electric vehicle. By aggregating, we can start to say to the grid, well, Tonic as a community, or this room as a community, is willing to give back some of its energy at a certain time, or willing to respond to a market message. So rather than us as a trading organization saying we're going to go and buy a bit more, actually, could we ask our fellow members of our community to use a, a little less? And as part of that, we start to unlock new benefits and new savings that are outside of the home. And that can contribute to all of our bill and actually make us a much more sustainable community on a whole. So there's a collective solution to a kind of an individual problem and an environmental problem that we, we're overlooking if we're getting ourselves off grid. And I think you know, that then begs a few questions, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But if you look around the room, there is, there is a real um, fight for the, for the customer, if you like, for your time, for your money. You know, is it the car company that wants to own the relationship? Is it the electricity supplier that wants to own the relationship? Do you want to get off grid and ignore all of them because they're all a pain in the backside? There is a facilitator role that's required. So how do we collectively understand the best thing to be doing? Frankly, we're all very busy. I've got better things to do myself rather than look at my per kilowatt hour every six minutes. It's not going to work on a mass market way. So there's a real facilitator role uh, that's required to do that. And that's what Tonic's been doing. So over the last two years, we've, we've built an energy supply business. We only supply renewable electricity for the obvious reasons. It's the only, only right answer. We supply 85,000 homes nationally. And we're looking to launch this next phase of proposition, which really starts to put together all of our different needs and unlock those savings that actually mean we're a far more sustainable and environmentally conscious uh, set of people. So if you're interested in finding out more, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it. Lots of questions, I know. And do come and grab one of us in the very, very fashionable T-shirts that we're wearing today or follow us on Twitter or on the web page. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That's really good. So, I mean, the, my, the, my first question is, because this is an area that really fascinates me, is... You've got a house with a battery, no solar, you've got a battery. So what you're talking about is what you're talking about, the ability to facilitate effectively trading between your battery and someone else's battery in, in, a, in a community or in a, across the, the, the... Yeah, exactly the that. Grid. I mean, uh, there's a few barriers to it, of course, because it's the UK electricity market. We like yeah. to make it complicated. But in principle, there's no reason why you have to have solar. So there are a million, million properties out there with solar of some sort already. Yeah. Um, actually, if we just added another 250,000 of those with batteries, then we're starting to generate some really quite significant volumes. Your point on, on if you've just got a battery and we optimize the right tariffs, then we can start to settle homes individually across our portfolio. So for example, you know, Beast from the East was a great example recently. Across our su supply portfolio, electricity prices went up. Everyone started panicking. The cost of electricity at that point in time was five, 10 times what it normally is. In an ideal situation, we'd just start managing that between us and saying, actually, let's protect ourselves from that risk right. and minimize that demand. So it's something that can be netted off within a community if we're set up in the right way. Right. So I really think we should, I mean, I want to open this up to questions. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions about this. It's a, a you know, a fascinating, it's, a, you know, the, a new business models are emerging so rapidly at the moment. It's yeah. really, really hard to keep up. But this does sound like a, you know, a completely different approach to how we, you know, how we consume and, and, and supply energy. I mean, it's a totally different take on the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, w we set up a, a utility supply business because we actually think the supply model is dead in its own right. It doesn't right. work. It's very top yeah. down. I mean, you can't run, run a newspaper article without there being some sort of bashing of an energy supplier. Yeah. It's really complicated, lots of things involved. But actually, this also simplifies it. We're, we're, we're taking away some of that complexity of the market and reducing the risk. Right, because I mean, what, what would you actually get? So if I, you know, if I was a, a tonic energy customer, what do I actually, what do I need any other equipment? I mean, you know, if, I don't know. I mean, well, yeah, what do I need as a customer? So, um, as I say, we're, we're rolling out the next phase at the moment. So, uh, assuming you're part of that, that, that kind of select few initially, um, we would we'd put you on electricity supply. We would install a smart meter because we need the what, the underlying data, interesting smart meters get a lot of bad press as well, but actually they're a really key enabler for the data underneath yeah. all of this. And then if you've got existing technology, we can actually already integrate with some of that side of things, or we can install technology through our partners and we start to aggregate that demand. So there isn't a huge amount you need to do, it's simply sw switch, have a smart meter, and right. then we get going. So right. it's a very much a, 
um, it, using the existing infrastructure. We're not trying to do something to, to create a new kind of set of technical requirements. Yeah, yeah. It's leveraging what's there. And I mean, smart meters are rolling out anyway. So, you yeah, know, I've, exactly. I've just had one fitted, and it, it is smarter than the what, my previous smart meter, which I think was a bit thick. Bit dumb. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. And Lots of phrases. And, and there's next generation smart meters coming very soon, I believe. There, there are, yeah. So th within smart, as I say, it does get a lot of pr bad press. And I've spent a lot of years working on it myself. Effectively, the difference between this, this version of smart meters and the next version is the next version is part of the central government scheme already. Yeah. The first version gets migrated over time. But for example, we, we can already integrate with a lot of other suppliers' smart meters. So right. a lot of people don't switch because they feel they're going to lose the smart meter. Yeah. That's nothing to do with the complexity of the smart meter. That's the supplier's problem. Uh, and, we, and we're looking to address that because we realize that's a barrier. Right. So, so can we open? I mean, uh, I, I'm, yes, there's, I'm guessing there might be some questions, and there certainly are. So there's, uh, a, ge there's a gentleman at the back whose hand shot up. I, b I believe that local transformers of converting from the high voltage on the grid down to the domestic 250 have problems in that it's difficult to sort of export electricity back from the 250 back into the grid through those transformers. So does this mean that there are going to be problems building communities where maybe one community is in bright sunshine and they want to export tons and tons of electricity across the grid to a dark part of the country where it's raining? Um, can you sort of tell us, you know, what, you know, are there grid problems with the grid? Is the grid going to have to adapt or does it affect your systems? Yes, it's a great question. So there, there are, there are modernisations that need to happen with the grid. I mean, interestingly, the, the example with California is, is more or less exactly what you just talked about, where there wasn't enough storage on the network and actually local transformers started having problems. We work closely with the distribution network and grid to identify those. So there is, there is very much a planning element. So particularly when we deploy new, um, new generation of any sort, we have to go through that process. Um, grid and the generators and, and the distributors are much more on the front foot now as part of the planning application, they're looking at the local network and managing it. Um, you're right, if we suddenly started as a single, you know, single button press discharging all at the same time, that would cause a problem. But as part of the installation, certainly with a the battery, there is an application we go through to, to work closely with the distributor and make sure that doesn't happen. So very real risk, but something that is, is being managed to an extent at the moment. Because, I mean, is there, is there an, I don't know if there's an enormous cost to adapt a substation to, uh, to allow this to happen, I mean... Uh, there, can, I, there can be. So as part of... I mean, the new build is an interesting uh, area to look at. As part of that planning work, actually, the, the new builder will, will, will work with the distributor to say right. what type of infrastructure is required. By moving towards this model, actually, you can reduce that infrastructure requirement because you start to manage those peaks and troughs and those outputs within the community itself. Right. So in lots of respects, it should reduce the need. And a big, big reason for this being important is it reduces the the overall load on the network yeah. because we're not, we're not actually generating as much as we need to overall. It's like a big leaky bucket. Rather than yeah. pouring more water in, we're actually sealing the, sealing the holes in the first place. So right. it's, it's very modernization. Two more questions we've got time for. Uh, uh, this gentleman here is very, very, very enthusiastic. Yes, one of the barriers I find to going generating my own power is my age. I, I worry about the payback time. Will I be around when it's actually started to give me profit? <laughs> well, I so really I'm, hope I'm so. Laughing I'm in the same position. You know, people say, yeah, it'll pay back in 25 years. 25, I'll be a, you know, <laughs> 500 years old. <laughs> well, well, I perhaps won't use the example as a specific example in case I get in trouble. But, but yeah, in payback has been a challenge, particularly for, for solar in the past. I mean, if you look, I think if you go around now, actually those costs have really come down quite dramatically. What we're looking to do is, and we're not quite there yet, but we are looking to remove that cost of capital up front. So we make it more about the proposition, the relationship, and we may help help that initially by owning that asset up front and avoid you needing to put your pound in the pocket for £12,000. And I think that is a massive barrier. It's a bit like EVs have been. They've been expensive, so solar. Um, and we're fully aware that to get this really mass market and take it out of, frankly, the middle classes and up, we've, we've got to do something to be able to make this affordable across those that need it the most as well. Yeah. It's really important. I mean, it is, it's also a really important point about new build. I mean, that's the thing I've become very... I think I've mentioned it here before, but very aware that there's a lot of new build going on. And it feels like, as a casual passerby of a new housing uh, development, that there's very little renewables being built into them. You just, you, you know, I just, I grind my teeth as I go past in my Nissan Leaf. Cane. They should all have solar panels. <laughs> they should all have single pitch roofs facing south. What's going on? <laughs> so it was you that went past my house. Yeah. Chazel, right? okay, <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, there is definitely a, a policy gap between, you know, Treasury 
bays for infrastructure, new building infrastructure. Yeah. It's not consistent. And frustration we've had, you know, the whole message underpinning this is, is reducing waste and being yeah. more sustainable. So if you're building new properties that are worse than three years ago just because you've removed the regulation, it's, it's bonkers. Yeah? Yeah. It's totally unmanageable. So we are working directly with a number of the new builders to, to prove this model right. and actually say it's not just an environmental thing, it's not a fluffy thing, it's a commercial benefit as well. Yes. Yeah. And it has to work commercially for the home builders to do it because they are they're under pressure. Yeah. Uh, interesting, I was just talking to um, a lady over there who I can, who I can see, who um, the, the flip side of that has been caught in one of the early kind of community energy type builds where she's actually locked into a rate and can't change and can't switch right. and can't get more sustainable. So we've got to be wary of that kind of unintended yeah. consequence. But you're right, building this and thinking this through actually massively reduces the total cost as well yeah. as the waste. It's really important. I'd like to thank Chris very much for this. I'm afraid we have run out of time. I've just been given the, by Dan, so we've got to stop. But uh, can you please give a really big round of applause to Chris Russell? Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you.